This murder happened December 22nd, 1981. Rhonda Henson was a popular, good-looking, athletic, 18-year-old uh, female who had just graduated high school. This happened in <clears throat> or near Valdez, North Carolina. And what's interesting is it didn't happen at a home. It didn't happen, uh, you know, at a party. It happened in her car. Now you say, well, there's a lot of murders that happen in cars. They do. Rhonda Henson was killed by a single gunshot, which it's not a drive-by, okay? Or somebody will think of uh, Tupac Shakur, where somebody is shot through the windows and are dead. Single gunshot through the rear of her vehicle, not the rear window, the trunk of her vehicle. The bullet travels through the trunk, scrapes one of the trunk braces into the rear seat, through the rear seat, into the front seat, and into Rhonda Henson's back, ultimately piercing her heart. The bullet did not exit, as you probably could guess, because it had no matter the speed it was going, it still had to gone through some metal, some seat backings twice in order to finally come into rest into her chest from the rear. Odd, right? First thing I think of is JFK with the magic bullet. But this is not quite as complicated as that. However, it is very, very intriguing. So, the backstory. December 22nd, 1981, Rhonda Henson had been working at a steel factory, Hickory Steel, uh, for a number of months. A lot of her friends had gone off to college. She stayed home to work. She was uh, a tennis uh, star, a good basketball player, uh, very athletic, good student, and... Through victimology, which is very important in all cases, but in this case especially because it tells you that she was a good girl. Now, what do I mean by that? Everybody has skeletons, okay? Everybody has something in their life that somebody may not know. When you do victimology, I always say that it's very important to not just interview family members. If you interview mom and dad, they're not going to say anything disparaging about their daughter or their loved one. Very rare occasions will they. Friends. Friends is a little bit better. If you want to know the sexual proclivity of a female victim, you talk to the friends. Do not talk to the parents. But if you really want to know what somebody's like, and I said this before, you have to talk to them. Yes, family, friends, co-workers. Go back to their high school. Interview the teachers, students. They'll tell you. So through a combination of all three of those, we come up with still, Rhonda Henson, there's nothing in her background to make her a bad person. So, she has a very low risk of being a victim. Now, those risks will increase depending upon who her friends are, who she hangs out with, who her boyfriend is, and when you start looking at them. Now, in this case, she had a boyfriend. Her boyfriend's name was Greg. Uh, same age, same high school. They've been dating for about two years. On the surface, by all accounts, Greg's a good dude. Kind of withdrawn, maybe a little bit, but uh, normal high school student. However, he seemed to be a little possessive of Rhonda. And, in fact, a number of years later, when investigators went back, to the high school to interview some people that knew both Greg and Rhonda. One person said, quote, that 
Greg was possessive, vital, and short fused. Dot 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 when it came to Rhonda. Okay? That's very important. Specifically, those words towards Rhonda. So he's very possessive. That doesn't make him a killer, folks. In this case, we have Greg. He essentially is the only person that investigators found has anything to do sexually, romantically, with Rhonda. So on December 22nd, Rhonda goes to a Christmas party for her work. She didn't seem to really want to go, but yet uh, there's some contradicting evidence to that because she went out and bought new clothes. Now, is that typical for a girl attending a party? Maybe. Yes. It's also typical for somebody wanting to impress somebody, maybe, that is at the party. Possibly. That's how I would look at that. However, she went to the party. At the party, nothing, you know, out of the ordinary happened. In fact, she didn't even drink. So, they le she leaves the party around, well, we're going to say 11.30, 11.45. And forgive me if I don't have the exact uh, times down. My research for this, which was intensive, relied a lot on newspaper reports and I got very upset because like the Charlotte Observer would report times that were different than another newspaper and I'm talking 15 20 minutes maybe an hour off so it was very hard to get an accurate time representation when she leaves the party she leaves with at least one girlfriend they go to her house because that is where uh, Rhonda kept her car, which was a Datsun 210, which I'm very familiar with because in one of my cases, the Don Miller case, my suspect, whose name was Greg, and they're not the same people, folks, uh, was driving and uh, killed Don Miller in that vehicle. But I digress. They go to the friend's house to pick up Rhonda's vehicle, which she left there. She goes inside and she asks to use the phone to call her boyfriend, Greg. This is around midnight. The friend and the friend's mom who are there are not eavesdropping, but they hear parts of the conversation and they could tell that it was not of a joyous tone. They heard her say, I'm going home. She hung up the phone. They asked if everything was all right, and she said that Greg was mad at her. But uh, she had gone into the bathroom like she was crying, and they noticed that when she came out. But she said she's got she had to get home. She's on her way home. She has to take Interstate 40, and she gets off exit 112. When she gets off the exit, she comes to a stop sign. To the left and to the right, she has an option. To, but to go home, <clears throat> she has to turn right. From what I see. She turns right on Mineral Springs Road. And she gets maybe, I, I don't know, it's anybody's guess. But from what I, I seen in the calculations that I did, probably five, six hundred yards up kind of an embankment, you know, a hill going upwards. Some will say steep hill. I can't tell. Uh, I can see that there's a grade in it, but I can't actually see how steep it is. She, at some point, and they speculate she's shifting from second gear to third gear, having to pass through neutral to do so. And in between second and third gear, she is shot. The car is in neutral. The shot renders her incapacitated. 
and the car drifts backwards into a ditch where it remains. Now a short time later, well let me back up, so witnesses, audio witnesses who heard a gunshot ring out and they described it as a high powered rifle which is important compared to a handgun said they heard that shot at 12.55 a witness comes forward and says I'm driving Mineral Springs Road going towards her car and I see a blue type of Chevelle vehicle with front end damage that was primered I pass them another witness stated they went past the area they seen her car with the back tire in the ditch with a white male they described you know five foot ten brown hair um, at the driver's side of her vehicle with the door open dome light on another group of kids who were coming from a hunting camp playing cards and drinking and such they observed the car as well and then according to one of the people in the car they realized somebody was hurt and they ran to get a cop when police get there they find her and she is not in the vehicle somebody had pulled her out and laid her in the grass in the ditch some will say she was posed because her arms were out at her side now whether the arms out at the side remain you know is a crucifixion pose or at her side like this no, no. I would, after you know, looking into this case, I'll give you my thoughts on it. But um, I'll give you my thoughts on whether she was posed or not. That's it. Okay, that's what we have.